thank you very much for uh, having me. Thank you, Sean, in particular, and thank you, Christian. Um, I, um, the the more, more appropriate title than the one that you see on the program would be The Errors of Classical Liberalism and the Idea of a Private Law Society. Um, I will first uh, talk about the errors of classical liberalism, and then I will come to the alternative, that is, the idea of private law society. Um, the first point I want to explain is uh, what I refer to as uh, the problem of social order. Um, imagine for a second that we live in the Garden of Eden. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, as you all remember, uh, there is no scarcity of uh, anything. Uh, and because there is no scarcity, it is impossible to have any conflicts with each other. If there is a superabundance of goods, uh, how can you possibly have uh, conflicts? Um, except for a minor problem. Even in the Garden of Eden, not everything is, uh, exists in superabundance. A few things are still scarce and conflicts can arise even in the Garden of Eden because of this. One thing that is scarce is our physical body. Uh, I can have a conflict with another person uh, regarding the use of uh, his or her body. And the other thing, by implication, that is of course scarce and conflicts can arise over this is the standing room on which the body rests. If I want to stand on a particular place and that place is already occupied by someone else, then a conflict is of course possible. In order to avoid these conflicts, it is necessary uh, to formulate rules of exclusive control or property rules regarding scarce resources. And in the Garden of Eden, what we would likely uh, accept as an all-around acceptable rule is um, everybody is the owner of his own physical body uh, and can do with it whatever he wants. Um, and if he wants to do something to the body of somebody else, then he needs to have the permission of this person. And the second related rule, everybody can move wherever they want, except to places that are already occupied by someone else. Um, if we leave the Garden of Eden and enter the real world, then of course this real world is characterized by the fact that we have all around scarcity. Uh, and accordingly, we need rules applying to all sorts of things, not just our own physical body, property rules uh, that specify who can and cannot exercise exclusive control over scarce resources in order to avoid conflicts. And classical liberals have uh, more or less all agreed, and not only classical liberals, uh, almost everybody agrees that there are three fundamental rules um, that make it possible, if we accept them, that conflict can be avoided in a society that is characterized by all around scarcity. The first one is the same that we have in the Garden of Eden. Everybody owns his own body. The second one relates to how do we acquire property, the right to exclusively control previously unowned resources. And there, the rule has been formulated, for instance, by, uh, uh, by John Locke. We acquire property in previously unowned resources by originally appropriating these resources, by being the first ones who do something to resources that nobody before did anything to. Um, by doing something to a piece of land, I become the owner of that piece of land. Um, that is the rule of the homesteading rule or the rule of original appropriation. Um, I can do then whatever I want with whatever I have originally appropriated. Other people need my permission if they want to do anything to it. That would avoid <coughs> conflict. The second rule is uh, I can then with my own body plus originally appropriated resources engage in production transforming these things into more valuable goods and thereby become the owner of what I have produced. And other people would need my permission if they want to use these products that I have produced. And thirdly, property can also be acquired 
through voluntary trade or contract from a previous owner to a later, uh, a later owner. Um, I do not want to go into great detail in defending these rules except to say this, um, that any alternative rule seems on the, from the outset rather absurd. Um, that a person should not own his own body, but somebody else should own it. Sounds absurd. The second one, that a person who originally appropriated something, um, changed it from an unowned status to an owned status, he should not be the owner. Somebody else who did not appropriate it should be regarded as the owner. Uh, likewise, it seems to be rather absurd that somebody who has not produced something should be regarded as the owner rather than the person who has actually produced, uh, produced something. And it is also quite clear from the outset that if and to the extent that we should follow these rules, not only would conflicts, could conflicts be avoided, all conflicts could be avoided to the extent that we follow these rules, uh, but that if we follow these rules by and large, prosperity will be maximized. If the producer does not own what he has produced, but somebody else owns part of it, then the incentive to be productive is reduced. If the original appropriator does not own what he has originally appropriated, then the incentive <coughs> to become an original appropriator using something that was previously not used at all for the first time is reduced and so forth. As I said, um, uh, I don't want to go into a great defense of these rules, I trust that they are intuitively sensible and that most people in their daily lives do indeed follow these rules. So the classical liberals accepted these rules as the fundamental rules making peaceful life in society possible. Now they realized, however, that even if these rules are intuitively plausible and are um, rules that lead to Productive, productive lives, uh, there's no guarantee that people will follow these rules. Uh, there are also people who might engage in robbery, murder, uh, steal things that other people own, and so forth. So there are lawbreakers. Uh, and every society has to deal with these lawbreakers in some way. Uh, how do we deal with with people who do not <coughs> adhere to these rules. And classical liberals held the position that this is a task of the state. The state has one and only one task, and that is to make sure that people adhere to the rules that I mentioned before, and that people break these laws will be threatened with punishment, or if they break them, they actually break them, are indeed punished for their uh, violation, for their law violations. Um, now whether this answer is plausible, and let me emphasize, those who advocate minimal states, and classical liberals did advocate the existence of minimal states, you know, this is the only task. The state does not do anything else. The state does not provide education. The state does not provide whatever, social welfare, the state does not provide streets, nothing. This is the only task that the state uh, takes on. Now if this answer is convincing or not, depends of course now on how do classical liberals define the state. And uh, the definition of the state that I suggest is rather uncontroversial, you can uh, same, same definition you define for us. Max Weber, uh, many, many others, uh, is this, this, the state is defined as a territorial monopolist of ultimate decision making or of ultimate arbitration in any case of conflict. That is, whenever there is a conflict between people, who owns what, who aggressed against who, who is the victim, who is the aggressor, this decision will be made by the institution of the state. There is no institution higher than the state to which we can possibly appeal. It's the last uh, uh, court of appellation, so to speak. 
And implied in this is um, that the state is also the territorial monopolist of taxation. That is, the state can unilaterally determine how much the citizens owe him for exercising this task of being the arbitrator of last resort, the ultimate uh, decision, decision maker. Um, now, what is wrong with this answer? If the state is defined like this, then it is easy to see what problems will immediately arise. This, I try to make the point now that a minimal state is, so to speak, an impossible utopia. Um, first thing, if you just look at what is the classic argument against monopolies, we call a state is a monopolist. What is the classic argument against monopoly is monopolies, from the point of view of consumers, um, tend to be more expensive or prices are higher than they otherwise would be and the product quality will be lower than it otherwise uh, would be. Um, they are not threatened by competition in this, in this field, uh, so they are not forced to operate at minimum cost and pass the minimum cost on to consumers in the form of lower, uh, lower prices, and they are not forced to continuously try to improve the product the product quality as it would have to if there were competition in existence. Now, but the situation with a state that is a monopoly of ultimate arbitration is even worse than the normal complaint that we have about monopolists. Because governments can produce bad things instead of just producing good things. And in order to see this, Let's go back for a moment to the definition that I gave. The government state is the ultimate arbiter, arbiter in any case of conflict. That includes that the state is also the ultimate arbiter in cases of conflicts involving itself. Um, that is, if a policeman hits you on the head and you complain about the fact that you have been hit on the head, then it is part of the same institution, the judge employed by the same institution that decides whether the policeman was entitled to do what he did or did something that he was not supposed to do. If you are the ultimate arbiter, arbiter in cases of conflict, you are also the ultimate arbiter in cases of conflict involving yourself. Um, and what follows from this is, of course, that you can expect that these people have self-interest like everyone else, um, that they will provoke conflicts and then decide the conflicts in their own, in their own favor. Um, and, of course, to make things even worse, then they decide also what you must pay them. Well, they are also the territorial monopolist of taxation. Then they also determine what you need to pay them for providing you with this wonderful service of being hit on the head by them first, then found guilty for being hit on the head, and then you have to pay them hundred dollars, thousand dollars, or whatever it happens, whatever happens to be. Um, so what you can predict, so to speak, is from the setup of an institution such as this, monopolist of ultimate arbitration with the power to tax, that the price of justice will continuously rise and the quality of justice will continuously fall. Any other prediction would have to assume, so to speak, miraculous transformation of people that angels run societies rather than normal people with normal instincts. So the idea of having a minimal state is from the outset a ridiculous idea. There is always a tendency that, of course, it will become, if not a totalitarian state, but certainly a rather big and uh, heavy-handed uh, heavy state. Um, now, the classical liberals compounded these errors uh, by another one. 
So this is a fundamental error. Um, to think that states can be yeah, neutral arbiters without any self-interest. Um, the, um, the second era was uh, that classical liberals uh, favored democratic states, in particular as a special form of a state. Uh, classical liberals were typically opposed to the big two monarchical states at that time. Most states in history were monarchical states. Not all of them, but if you go back in history, and if there is a state at all, most of them tended to be monarchical states. Um, what was the classical liberal opposition or argument against monarchical states in particular? Uh, what disturbed them about monarchical states was the fact that monarchs obviously have privileges. Um, they are subject to a different kind of law uh, than the rest of the people are. Uh, and the rest of the people, of course, have no hope uh, that they will ever become king or queen themselves. Um, and in order to solve this problem, uh, that some people have privileges and other people are under underprivileged, uh, so to speak, um, they advocated, or they thought this would constitute a solution to this problem, to create equality before the law, that is, privileges are an attack against the idea of equality before the law, obviously. They proposed that all we need to do is uh, make entry into the governmental apparatus or into the state open. Just everybody can become king or prime minister. Everybody can become queen. By opening entry into the state apparatus to everyone, they thought privileges would disappear and equality before the law would be introduced. Now, it's easy to see that this is an error to believe this. All that happens if you change from kings to democratic rulers um, is that you change personal privileges uh, or replace personal privileges by functional privileges. Um, the king had a personal privilege. A prime minister or any governmental official has functional privileges. If he is a prime minister, then he can, as a public official, do things that private individuals cannot do. That is, the duality of law, the higher law of princes and kings, as compared to the lower law, so to speak, of the regular citizens, this duality remains in existence under democracy just as much as before, uh, and reappears in the distinction between private law on the one hand and public law on the other, on the other hand. Uh, if you are covered by public law, then you can engage in activities that you would regard as criminal activities if they were done as a private citizen. Uh, to give you some examples, if I steal your wallet, then under private law, this is, of course, treated as stealing. Um, on the other hand, if I'm the taxman, if I'm a of government official and do the same thing, then this is covered by public law and is called taxation. Um, if I take you and force you to work in my garden, then if I would do that as a private citizen to some other private citizen, this would, would be regarded as a kidnapping and enslavement and would be accordingly punished. On the other hand, if I do that as a public official, then that is called uh, social service, uh, the draft, and, uh, and similar things. Or if I take something from you against your will as a private citizen and then give it to somebody else, then under private laws this would be considered uh, stealing and fencing of stolen goods. Uh, if I do the same thing as a public official covered by public law, then it is called social policy, redistribution of income. In fact, it is no difference whatsoever. Um, but the situation is even worse, of course, than 
only this, that the distinction between two different types of laws remains in existence just as much as it existed under, um, under monarchy. Um, another important difference is the kings old in the old times, not obviously kings like they exist nowadays with the only representative figureheads, um, considered the country, so to speak, as their private property. Um, in the following sense, uh, they could pass it on to future generations, and they could also uh, sell parts of it off and, and keep the money themselves. Um, democratic politicians, prime ministers and so forth, members of parliament, who knows what, uh, they are temporary caretakers of countries, but not owners. They cannot sell anything and keep it privately, keep the receipts privately, nor can they determine who their successor will be. Uh, for a short period of time, they are entitled to take advantage of the country without owning it. Now, does that make a difference when it comes to how you will behave? And the answer seems to be rather obvious. Um, if I give you a house, one time, as the owner, which you can sell the house uh, in the market, or you can pass it on as in the form of inheritance. And the other time, I give you the same house, but I tell you, you are for four years the caretaker of the house. You don't own the house. You cannot determine who will get it afterwards. Uh, you cannot sell it in the market. Uh, will that make a difference how you treat your house? And the answer is, it seems to me rather clear that it, the, you will treat your house differently. In the one situation, if you are the owner of the house, you will always keep in mind the repercussions that your dealings with the house have on the market value of the house if you were to sell it. You are concerned about capital consumption, possible capital consumption that results from certain use of the, that you make of the house. Um, and you will be concerned about giving something away in the future generation that is still valuable. If you are, however, only a temporary caretaker, not the owner of the house, then your interest is to maximize current income, even if this implies capital, cons capital consumption. Uh, you can increase your rental income from your house, for instance, by uh, putting 50 people into the house double uh, one bed above the other and so forth. Uh, and then after three or four years, the house might be more or less in ruins. But your income in the meantime has of course been higher. And since you are not the owner of the house, you don't uh, care much about the fact that the capital value, the market price of the house falls in the meantime. Um, so to make this story short, what we can recognize is that kings, by and large, have a longer-term perspective and have, by and large, a greater incentive in preserving the value of the country than democratic caretakers have who are only temporary, uh, temporarily in charge and do not own anything. Capital consumption is far more prevalent uh, under democratic regimes than it is under um, uh, under monarchical, uh, monarchical regimes. Uh, the orientation of democratic politicians is extreme short-term uh, short orientation. I have to rob the country as quickly as possible because in five years, six years, seven years, I might no longer be able to do it. Um, the final point when it comes to the additional mistake made by advocating democratic states rather than monarchical states. Again, keep in mind, I'm not defending monarchies per se here. Uh, just comparing evils, so to speak, and say if we would have to make a choice between these two evils, then monarchy might actually be an advantage. Uh, by the way, the same argument applies to the idea of slavery. Um, let's say if you have the only possibility is you can be a, you can be a privately owned slave, or you can be a publicly owned slave like they existed in the former Soviet Union. 
that is where you also could be put to work and you could not run away. Just as a private slave could be put to work and he cannot run away. But under what regime was there more capital consumption? In this case, killing people, uh, starving them to death. Under private slavery or under the type of slavery that we had in the Soviet Union? And the answer should be quite clear. In the Soviet Union, hundreds of uh, 30, 30, 40 million people were just killed outside of, uh, in, in, during peacetime. What a waste of capital, so to speak. No private slave owner would ever engage in policies such as this. So the comparison between monarchy on the one hand, democracy on the other, should always be taken as two evils are compared and we try to make a decision which one would be preferable over the other. Uh, and there's another argument why monarchies uh, are more uh, preferable. I have to see how I do it. Um, the, uh, That is right, we argued, argued in favor of democracy that we have open competition who becomes prime minister. Worse, uh, in the case of monarchs, it is perfectly clear uh, I, cannot, I can never become the monarch. Entry into the government is uh, closed. Um, rather than being a disadvantage that entry is closed, however, this turns out to be an advantage once we keep in mind that governments can produce bads rather than goods. Um, consider this, the, the following uh, possibilities. Uh, yes, kings can be bad people, no question about this. Um, if they are bad people, uh, rip off the public, then however, the dynasty is concerned, the family of the king is concerned that they might lose their power. They will typically surround them with advisors who uh, um, make it difficult, difficult for him to engage in uh, exploitative policies. And if nothing works at all, then they might even determine one of their relatives to kill this guy in order to preserve the power of the dynasty. On the other hand, a king, because he comes to power by accident of birth, can also be a decent guy. Um, he does not have to be concerned about uh, re-election or anything like this. So he might be an old, nice granddaddy uh, who leaves people more or less alone. Works off a little bit here and there, but people like him by and large. Now ask yourself, can this ever occur if you have democratic elections? Um, and there the answer seems to be, unless we are looking only at small villages where everybody knows everybody else and has some sort of idea how they acquired their wealth or how they didn't acquire their wealth. Uh, if we look at societies with millions of people, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, then any, anyone uh, who rises to the top must be a skilled demagogue. Uh, only bad people rise to the top under democracy, whereas, and because of the fact that everybody can say, even if he is bad right now, in four years there will be the next election, so in five years there will be the next election, these bad guys rarely get killed off. Uh, whereas kings, because you know, once a guy is bad, he will stay there until he is dead, you might as well kill him fast, uh, because otherwise, things uh, last forever in this way. Um, okay, now, now to the question. So if the classical liberals were wrong in this, first in their advocacy of states in general, and then their advocacy of democratic states in particular, um, what is the alternative? And the alternative is what I call a private, a private law society. A private law society is a society in which there is no difference between different types of law, public law and private law. Every person, every institution, every firm is subject to exactly the same laws as every other one. Um, 
every institution must have acquired its property in the same way as everyone else through so these activities that I mentioned before, original appropriation, production, or contractual uh, acquisition. Uh, and every, so every institution um, must burn its money in the honest way by producing something for which they find uh, voluntarily paying uh, consumers. No institution is subject to different laws than any other institution. Now, what does that uh, imply in particular? How do, how would a society, a private law society, produce law and order? Uh, how would they make sure that people adhere to the rules that I mentioned at the outset? How do they deal with lawbreakers? First, very briefly, of course, in such a society, self-defense would be permitted. Um, and it should be emphasized that self-defense can be quite effective when it comes to combating um, <coughs> crime and dealing with criminals. Um, we know that in the so-called Wild West, for instance, when practically no state existed in the United States, and defense was more or less private defense. People were heavily armed, um, and the Wild West was not very wild. Um, imagine, for instance, if you have a society where people have arms, and you engage in a bank robbery. Um, how likely is it that you will come out alive out of a bank robbery in a bank where every bank um, employee is armed? And the answer is, you will not likely survive a bank robbery successful. Um, you will be shut down before you enter, uh, before you leave, uh, leave the premises. Several studies, many studies have been done on this. That is a general consensus, that violence was quite mild, um, or concerned only willing participants. Obviously, if you have willing participants in crime, then it is not a crime. Uh, if uh, Mike Tyson beats up uh, Mr. Holyfield or vice versa, uh, we would not consider this to be crime. Those are willing participants in violent activities. Um, but of course, and I should make you aware, this type of argument that heavily armed populations by and large tend to reduce crime rates has been made most effectively by an American economist, John Lott, who has wrote, written a famous book, uh, More Guns, Less Crime, uh, and demonstrates that with a huge amount of empirical data that the more heavily armed the population, the population is, other things to the same, the lower tends to be, uh, tends to be the crime rate. Maybe I should just uh, give a little anecdote here, too. Uh, there, there were the, some towns in the United States, uh, rival towns. In, in one town, uh, the, top of the city council uh, determined nobody is allowed to have any guns at all. Um, and another town said, in order to yeah, paint them in a bad way, said everybody in our town must have a gun. Uh, now, where do you think crime rates rose, and where do you think crime rates fell? Uh, criminals might be bad people, but they are not stupid. Uh, of course, I don't go to the town where I know that everybody has a gun. I go to the place where I know nobody has a gun, and I will get away successfully with what I'm planning to do. But as I said, self-defense is important, but it is, of course, only a minor aspect of what I want to talk about. Just as we don't... Um, produce our own suits or shoes, uh, not even our own uh, hair do, but uh, rely on the advantages of division of labor uh, in the provision of services such as this. We would, of course, also rely on the advantages of division of labor when it comes to the production of law and order. And what sort of organizations would likely come about in the market to offer services um, of protecting life and property, 
be pro private police forces, uh, private arbit arbitration agencies, and uh, private uh, insurance agencies. They might be sometimes working together, sometimes competing against each other. Uh, we don't have to be concerned about the particular um, makeup and uh, construction of these uh, agencies. Now, what would be the consequence if we had privately organized privately, freely funded organizations providing law and order as compared to the current situation where a monopolist does this. First point is, of course, if we have competition, then prices will generally fall and quality will increase. And I will detail that uh, in a second. The second important point is, there would be no such thing as an overproduction of security. All goods, put, all goods and services compete against each other. We have, there exists scarcity of resources. Whatever I sp spend more on police protection, uh, that implies that I can drink less beer. Um, whatever I spend on uh, paying judges, the implication is that I can uh, make less vacations or something like that. Every good competes with every, every service competes with every other one. How much production of security do we need? How many resources do we need in order to produce security? The answer is, for the state who is a monopolist, there is no clear-cut answer. Um, you know, how many resources should be committed to car production? How many resources should be committed to uh, butter production or milk production? Consumers decide that based on how important this product is as compared with that product. But consumers do not decide that currently how important security is. Um, the more money the government has, the more it can provide of this. But how much? Since consumers do not decide it, the more, the better. Um, do we need one policeman or 100,000 policemen? Does a policeman have to be paid $100 or $10,000? Um, do we need one tank or uh, a flamethrower on top of the tank? Do we need a personal bodyguard standing next to us with a, uh, with a pistol or a stick? Uh, do we need two of them? All of this is currently must be decided somehow too, but it's decided in a completely arbitrary way. It has nothing to do with consumers. Um, if there would be a free provision of these services, there would be no overproduction of security. People just get as much security as they think is appropriate in their particular case, and particular cases can be very different. Obviously, you need more in cities than you need in the countryside, um, and so forth. Not all people have the same desire to feel secure as far as their life and uh, property is, uh, is concerned. Now I come to more important points. Um, insurance companies are even currently in the business of protecting you. Um, they um, you have contracts with insurance companies that say if such and such happens, we will indemnify you in such and such a way. Um, life insurance as yet, property insurance and so forth. Um, you realize that insurance companies would only be able to get money from you if they promise indemnification in case something happens. <coughs> Do states indemnify you in any way if something happens to you? Uh, if somebody breaks into your house, kills you, and so forth, and the answer? No. States do not indemnify you if they fail in the task that they consider to be their main task, namely to uh, protect your life and your property. Insurance companies must indemnify you. Insurance companies must also offer you a contract of what will happen provided such and such has occurred. Um, do we have anything like a contract currently with the government um, that such and such will be done 
if such and such has occurred? And the answer is okay. no. We have no it, we have no contract contractual relationship whatsoever. Not only this, states in the course of the game even change the rules of the game. That is, they engage in legislation. Something that was considered to be a crime yesterday might no longer be a crime tomorrow. Something that was a crime yesterday um, and, and, vice, and vice versa. Imagine an insurance company <coughs> would say, you see, we might, in the course of uh, the duration of the contract, unilaterally change the rules of the game. Would anybody ever take out insurance with a company such as this? The answer would be that people say, you must be crazy. Of course, I want to have stipulated from the outset what will happen. And you cannot unilaterally say, no, no, yesterday we said such and such, but of course, today we decided to do something else. Yesterday we said that such and such will be the price, but today we decide, no, no, the price will be very different. Um, That, um, okay. a very important point is this. Um, if you sign a contract with an insurance company, uh, we can imagine three possible scenarios. The first one is um, people who have conflicts with each other are insured by the same agency. Um, everybody knows that this is one possibility. I can have a conflict with somebody who is insured by the same insurer that I insured with. Obviously, the insurance company must, in their contract, offer stipulations what will happen in such a case. Um, there are laid out steps. If you complain against him, and you are both members of the same company, then these and these procedures will be set in motion. And both parties have agreed to this. They come to a conclusion. The conclusion will be enforced. They have agreed to this. Um, second possibility is I have a conflict with somebody else uh, who is insured by a different insurance agency. Again, everybody knows from the outset that this is also a possibility. So each individual insurance company has provision in its contracts. What will I do if? One of my clients has a conflict with a client of a different company. If both companies come to the same conclusion, you are guilty or I am guilty, then again, there is no problem. It will be enforced. This is not fundamentally different from what the situation is right now. The most interesting case is this. Again, two people are insured with different companies. Um, and uh, the two insurance companies do not agree. That is, one company says, this guy is guilty, and the other one says, this guy is guilty. Now again, everybody knows from the outset that this is also a possibility. That can always happen. Accordingly, every company will, of course, have provisions. What will we do if such a case arises? I would not want to be insured with a company that has no provision for this contingency that can arise any time. What will they do in this situation? And the answer is, in this case, the only possibility that they have is to resort to independent arbitration and emphasizing independent. That is, the arbitration agency that must now decide which one of the clients of these two companies is right and which one is wrong must be independent of both companies. You realize that currently, when you appeal a decision and go to a higher court, and not still higher court, and so forth, they are, of course, all part of the same organization. They are not independent of each other. What would now be the incentive of these independent arbitrators who offer arbitration services for these types of conflicts? Um, no arbitrator has any guarantee that he will be used again for the same purpose in the future. They must compete for clients. In this case, the insurance companies would be their clients. Um, and what they must do in order not to lose clients is come up with a decision 
that is viewed by both companies and by implication by all clients of both companies as a fair solution to the problem. Otherwise, one or the other company would lose clients and they would not choose this arbitrator in future cases. That is precisely because we have competition among arbitrators is the tendency <coughs> set in motion to develop a law, uh, to develop law and legal procedures and so forth that uh, represent uh, the uh, um, greatest possible agreement among all people to create something like a universally accepted law. You realize that even currently we do have something like this, or at least something similar to it. We do not have, for instance, a world government. Um, and citizens of different countries can have conflicts with each other without having one authority that covers them both. But there's a, a Swiss a Swiss person living uh, right across the border from some Austrian person. So they can have conflicts with each other. Uh, what does a Swiss person go? The Swiss person goes to the Swiss court. The Austrian person goes to the Austrian court. Uh, if they agree, it will be enforced. If they don't agree, they need to go even currently to some sort of arbitration. Um, that is. The world as a whole is still in a, in a state of anarchy, so to speak. Uh, we do not have a world government. We have competing governments, competing legal codes. And the relationships between Austrians and Swiss citizens living just across the border from each other is no more violent than the relationship of two Austrians living in two adjacent Austrian villages or two Swiss people living in two adjacent <laughs> Swiss villages. This alone shows already that the idea that we need to have one monopoly decider is false. It is borne out by the fact of uh, international anarchy, so to speak, that the system, like the one that I described, can indeed function. We emphasize a few other points. Uh, insurance companies, because they indemnify people in case they have become victimized, tend to be efficient in a way that government providers of security will never be. Uh, why would they, people want to have by and large three services provided. One, prevention of crime should not occur at all. Second, if it does occur, I want my stuff back, if possible. Um, and if I can't get it back, I want the perpetrator to be caught and punished. Now we look at these three dimensions. Why would a government policeman who is paid out of taxes be efficient in preventing crimes in the first place? Uh, if he prevents it, his salary will not be higher. Um, for him, the incentive is to just if possibly do absolutely nothing. Um, uh, hang around and drink coffee and uh, drive around with a car and do things like this, but why should he prevent any crime? Um, why would an agent employed by insurance company tend to be effective in preventing crime? The answer, if he prevents crime, then he doesn't have the insurance company doesn't have to pay up. So there's a financial incentive to be good at this. How about uh, finding things that were stolen and so forth? Uh, what incentive does a policeman have to ever find anything? The answer is they have no incentive whatsoever and they don't find anything. Um, <laughs> if your car is stolen, the, the police just files it away. I have a friend who star car got stolen in, in Italy. Um, he went to the Italian police and reported that my car is stolen and then ask him, what do you do? Well, we follow the law. <coughs> That's it. Uh, then he went to his German insurance company and uh, reported that the car had been stolen. And the insurance agent found the car a few days later. It was 
severely damaged, but nonetheless, the incentive is, of course, an entirely different one. If you find something, you don't have to pay up. But since the government doesn't pay up anyway, why engage in any effort to fight the damn thing? Um, last thing, then you want to, to, you want, want to catch the guys. Um, now, what happens for capital pun for uh, capital offenses? Yes, the police tends to find people for car thieves and uh, burglars, and so most of the time they don't even engage in any activity trying to find them. But what if they do? What do they then do? Again, then uh, the uh, perpetrators are jailed away. Um, and if I remember correctly, the number was something like uh, in the United States to jail a person for a year costs about seventy thousand dollars per person per year. Um, you, you can then complain about uh, not getting the right muesli in the morning uh, and uh, not having fully functioning workout equipment, not being able to just uh, watch TV all day, uh, all day and night. Or Play like table tennis or something like something like this. And who pays for this generous treatment of criminals? The, the victim. So you are not only first victimized. On top of it, you then have to pay for the incarceration of the aggressor. Um, what would an insurance company do uh, if they find the guy? First of all, they would have an incentive to find them. And then, of course, they would do what punishment initially was intended to be for. That is, we have to try to make the victim as whole again as we can possibly do it. Um, and who has to do it? Of course, the perpetrator has to do it. He has to pay the victim compensation. Victims nowadays do not get any compensation whatsoever. Despite the fact that states, of course, promise protecting your life and your property <coughs> is my most important task that I have uh, set up for me. Um, so, an entirely different incentive structure is faced by insurance companies as compared to uh, state, state police. Um, a few additional <coughs> tiny points I want to make. Um, how would victimless crimes be handled in a private law society? You know that currently, of course, large proportions of you know, the police budget and so forth are dedicated to going after victimless crimes. <coughs> victimless crimes being those, those crimes where there is no victim. Uh, which normal people would be considering maybe vices, but not crimes. <clears throat> Prostitution, gambling, drug use, and so forth. Uh, there's no victim involved in any of this. These are all acts among consenting adults. Um, but you realize that the war on drugs in the United States swallows up huge sums of, uh, of money. Uh, most of the people, in car most of the black people incarcerated in the United States are actually just incarcerated for, for minor drug offenses that they have committed. Um, now, how would a freely funded insurance agency system handle victimless crimes? Like let's say you go to your insurance company and they would say, what do you want to have protected? You know, my life, my property, and so forth. And then they would say, yeah, how about going after prostitution, after gambling, after drug use? Um, the price, of course, would be far higher if they also go after these types of activities. Uh, they would need additional resources in order to go after this. Um, and then they would give you the price list. They would, if you want to have this all done, that costs such and such amount. And if you want to have only this, it costs only this this amount. Uh, most people would then say, I want to be defended in my 
my life, my property, and that's it. The other stuff I don't like very much. Maybe I chip in a uh, penny or something like this. Uh, make some propaganda that it's not good to behave like this. But by and large, victimless crimes would disappear as a crime, would, as they should. Um, how about, and this gets, gets me back to the problem of self-defense, what would be the attitude of insurance companies toward people possessing arms to engage in possible self-defense? Uh, you know that what states do in this regard. States try to disarm us. Um, in all states, there are attempts under the way completely uh, bar us from acquiring any, uh, any weapons. And that's, of course, what you would expect from an agency that is, by and large, a protection racket itself. If you are in the business of robbing people yourself, of course you want them unarmed. Um, so it's not very difficult to explain that states do not want us to have any arms. So now imagine you go to an insurance company, well, what, I want to be protected, and the insurance company would tell you, yeah, but first you have to just hand over all knives, all hammers, uh, all guns, everything that can be used in order to harm somebody or injure somebody. Now, every normal person would then get the idea, there must be something really strange about this insurance company that insists that I even hand over my forks and knives uh, and then promises me to defend myself. Uh, no one would want to have any dealings with a company such as this. Quite the contrary, these insurance agencies which encourage you to own guns and to know how to handle them in a safe way. They would give you a discount if you can prove to them that you know how to shoot somebody between the eyes from 100 yards away. <laughs> uh, in, the same, in the same way as you offer you a discount if you have a safe at home. Uh, instead of having your jewelry always on the kitchen table, you lock them up in a safe. Of course, the premium that you have to pay for insurance, uh, house insurance, for, tends to be lower if you can show to the insurance company that you do have such equipment at home. The same thing for weapons. So a very different attitude toward consumers than we find, um, than, than we find with, uh, with states. Um, moreover, um, All insurance companies would insist that their clients must engage in non-provocative civil behavior. Um, no insurance company, for instance, would insure you for contingencies such as this. I provoke him to the hilt and then he hits <coughs> me in the head uh, and now I call for my insurance company to do something about this bad guy. Um, obviously, they would, in order to offer as low a premium uh, as possible, insist you have to engage in such a way that you don't provoke conflicts with others. And if you are found as having provoked conflicts or having initiated conflicts, then, of course, you will not be covered at all by us. Uh, so, civil behavior is a precondition of even getting offered a contract by an insurance uh, company. Um, they will also, by and large, make the existence of vigilante justice impossible. Um, that is, insurance companies would say, yes, of course, if you are aggressed against, you are entitled to defend yourself immediately. But if something has happened to you and it's not a direct confrontation, uh, the, the robber is gone and so forth, even if you know who he is, you don't engage in um, uh, vigilante justice. Um, because vigilante justice invites and retaliation and retaliation against retaliation and that is all expensive and we want to cause lower costs instead of raising costs 
Because of this, we insist that whenever you have any complaint against anyone, then we go through a regular procedure which is set up, uh, written down in our contract that we have in order to make sure that this eternal uh, retaliation and back retaliation process comes to, uh, doesn't even start or comes to an end as quickly um, as, quickly as, uh, as possible. Um, I think um, with this, I will stop and uh, take a few take a few questions. Absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. A forest of hands. I will start with Jan Lester. Thank you. Uh, you appear to be. Uh, implying there's a hard distinction between classical liberals and libertarians, but surely some classical liberals uh, were anarchists, if not in name. They were anarchists, or they were anarchists at some point in their career, and uh, almost all libertarians are not anarchists. So I've struggled with this myself, trying to find out whether I could introduce a distinction, and I can't really see that it's there. But that would be just a semantic problem, so to speak. Um, my, my concern here was, of course, only to show what is wrong with the position of those who argue in favor of the minimal state and the accepted definition of the state as I defined it, and what the alternative would be, how, how you call them, uh, who belongs into that group and who doesn't, is another, is another question. More than how he was classical. But, but yeah, but, one, but one, yes, he considered himself to be a classical liberal, but was of course an anarcho capitalist. Yes. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, gentleman here, and then we'll move <coughs> on take up. Uh, Martin Ree, uh, is North Korea the exception that proves the rule regarding dynasties? No, I, I mean, again, first of, first of all, um, they are no monarchs. Um, there is no uh, dynasty that is guaranteed uh, in public opinion that they will follow, uh, uh, follow the, in, the, in the line. Um, also, the idea of, of socialism is incom incompatible with, um, with a monarch who regards this as his private as his private property. So I don't think, uh, as, as a matter of fact, I believe that these types of dictatorships are in a way the outgrowth of crises which are almost invariably produced by democratic regimes. Um, <laughs> democratic, uh, democratic regimes because they engage in massive redistribution of income, uh, set up welfare, welfare state systems, are invariably doomed to economically collapse. A crisis then breaks out, and the solution to the crisis is to have a dictator rise to the top. Um, ask yourself this. Uh, was Hitler more democratic or less democratic than, let's say, Kaiser Wilhelm? Was the last Russian Tsar more democratic or less democratic than Lenin and Stalin? And the answer is, of course they were less democratic. Hitler was, of course, democratic. Uh, Lenin and Stalin were, of course, democratic figures, so to speak, as compared to the Russian Tsar. So, dictatorships uh, are the outgrowths of democracies that have run out of luck. Ben Cousin, and then we'll, we'll take any questions. Uh, Thank you for your compelling logic, Professor Hopper. Just a couple of points. One, uh, in your thumbnail sketch uh, uh, of classical liberalism uh, uh, in uh, a Lockean luck, uh, you uh, talked about uh, uh, primary appropriation rather than mixing one's labor 
uh, uh, with a portion of nature. I'm wondering if that's an important distinction to you or merely a matter of semantics. Secondly, uh, uh, in your private law society, uh, you didn't mention uh, the uh, hostile encounters or disputes between insured persons and non-insured persons, or, for that matter, between two non-insured persons. Uh, could you make a comment on that, please? Uh, yeah, what, what was the first okay, point? Mixing one oh, later. I think that, that would be just a matter of semantics. I mean, original appropriation is by mixing labor with resources, where, whereby what, what constitutes mixing or does not constitute mixing, there, there might be um, certain clarifications might be necessary that I would be able to give, but didn't, didn't want to provide here because I, I thought that was more or less clear. Um, the, second, the second question is, what do we do with uninsured people? Now, first of all, I would think that Practically speaking, uh, that will hardly ever be a problem because societies that are decently wealthy and societies that I have in mind would, of course, be decently wealthy, um, uh, that is composed of people who own quite a bit of property, make it almost necessary that anybody takes out insurance. The more things you own, the more important does the service of being insured become. No businessman, for instance, could ever afford not to be insured. Um, but given that it might nonetheless occur, um, there I think um, insurance companies might well have procedures to deal with this, show simply goodwill. Um, because their own clients might want that uninsured people will be treated fairly and decently as well. Um, unless you have too many free riders, that is people who just anticipate that they will be taken uh, care of, um, and they, again I would say they would be treated fairly except they would be billed by it. Um, and uh, if, if they are not willing uh, to pay, pay their bill for having received uh, justice, uh, then, uh, then you might force them indeed uh, to, make this, uh, to make this payment. Um, if two people are uh, uninsured, um, you have you have lawyers who take cases, uh, the contingency cases, um, who offer services. Say, look, um, I know that you are not insured. I'll take. I'm interested in preserving your uh, rights. If we win, um, then you owe me a part of the settlement that uh, that I receive. That is. Agents will spring up um, that make profits uh, from contingency uh, from contingency fees. Wouldn't you say very briefly? But wouldn't you say that, for instance, if you were not insured, you couldn't rent a car, you couldn't go to the bank account? You couldn't. You couldn't that's right. Yes. Because people would say, "Well, we don't want to deal with you because we don't know what would happen in case there is a conflict." Yeah. Hardly anyone would de have any dealings with people who have no, no insurance whatsoever. And no, no, and certainly no businessman, no normal person who engaged in normal activities would do without it. Other questions? Um, gentleman here. Yes. Yeah, that's Fred Calgo. Um, if you were going back to the Garden of Eden, it seems there's one other right that you would have, uh, and that would be um, if you're talking with somebody, someone else isn't allowed to stand there yelling at you so you can't have a conversation, so you would have freedom of speech, it seems, as, as well. But yeah, no, only the, the, the yelling, the freedom of speech you have, but if you yell, that might be a, that might be an invasion of my uh, yeah that's good it's, it's an impact on the body but it's, yeah. it's, it's sort of out there 
But again, this will be a, a minor clarification that is yeah. necessary. In this my, my other question is, is the other case that wasn't mentioned, is after the two disagreeing insurance companies go to bind an arbitration, um, and a, a judgment is held against you know, one of the insurance companies to pay the, to pay the damages, uh, what if that insurance company doesn't make the payment? Uh, not necessarily because they don't want to, but maybe they have a cash flow crisis or something, and they, and they just don't make the payment. Then how does the, the victim get their, um, their payment? Um, yeah, cases like this might well uh, occur, but if they do occur, then this insurance, this insurance company would tend to lose clients very quickly. Uh, so uh, occurrences such, such like this would by competition be driven out of the market. It's also important to realize that these, these types of problems can of course currently also exist. You see that we not, one should not imagine that any conceivable problem will be immediately solved in a private law society. We always have to compare how would they be solved there, how many mistakes, errors would be made there as compared to how they are solved now under monopolistic aus auspices and what the, pro what the price that we have to pay currently. <laughs> currently. So, of utmost importance is always that we are not comparing fantasy worlds. We are comparing two realistic scenarios and all that. Would the problems be more frequent or would they be less frequent? Would they be handled more efficiently or less efficiently? And in this comparison, it seems to be always striking that this type of regime that I propose would be infinitely superior over what we currently have, that we still have problems there. Um, is true as long as mankind is what it is. Paul Kulun. Uh, <coughs> Professor Hoffa, uh, I completely agree with you uh, that the fully private anarcho libertarian society would be the best and most desirable solution uh, to our social problem. Uh, but at the moment, we live under states, and we have to deal with states and, and treat with them. Uh, and obviously, we have to come to some kind of compromise with the fact that the state has power. Do you have any principles you could outline about how we ought to, what our relations with the state ought to be? Because if we just say, you know, uh, this is ideally what we want, we want what we want, we're doing what Rothbard called, I think, a bit less sectarian than what's just, just yeah. being ideal and not being practical about it. How, how ought we to relate to the state, given where we are now? Obviously, th th that's a question of prudence. Um, we are not people who refuse on principle to pay in taxes and say, oh, there is some, uh, 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 the amendment that introduced the uh, uh, income tax was not, is not constitutional, and I'm right, and so forth, and then they are jailed for this. No, they might be right, but I think they are stupid to do something like this. Um, so you can just make a judgment. What can I get away with? Yes, you have, it is correct, so to speak, to regard the state as a criminal organization. Um, if you deal with criminals, if you deal with bullies around you, uh, you don't just say, you are a criminal, I'm right, uh, because you will end up on the losing end. Uh, you are careful, you just think, you see, can I get away with it right now, maybe not. In that case, I shut up and don't talk anymore. Uh, or maybe I have uh, enough people backing me up, I can make a little stink or a big stink. Um, so a matter of prudence. The second thing is, what one has to do is to create uh, some, in, in Marxian terms, what one has to create is a class consciousness among the people. Um, that we recognize who the enemies are and who the victims are. Um, and to the extent that it is possible that they allow us to do this, say it. Um, look, in the, in the current situation, states always try to blame businessmen as being exploiters rip-off agents and so forth, and they themselves as wise and benevolent uh, people. Uh, to blame somebody else instead of blaming oneself is their strategy. What we have to do is to counter this type of thing. The current financial crisis. What do we read in the paper? 
oh, this is an indication of the failure of capitalism. Right? So what we have to point out is, is there a central bank? Is the central bank a governmental organization? Uh, would this crisis have been possible without a central bank that can create money out of thin air? Would it have been possible to extend loans to people who have no income, uh, no assets whatsoever? Uh, if these banks would know that if they don't pay, I'm bankrupt, or is that only possible if these banks know, yeah, there is the lender of last resort. The lender of last resort is just the, count, the biggest counterfeiter of all. Um, so the government can, of course, master all crises. I could master all crises too, if the bank one, of course, and I am the only one who can turn on the printing presses, yeah, then, then I can, of course, present myself as I have rescued the entire system. I have made sure, I have made sure that you all get your money back. Of course, it was a consequence that the country is flooded with money, with currently, because people increase their cash holdings, it does not show up in the form of inflation, but it will in the future show up in the form of massive, inf massive inflation. Um, so we have, to, we have to create an atmosphere where we put the blame on those people who are to blame and laugh in the face of those people who say this is an indication of the failure of capitalism. Capitalism has not failed. The government has failed. Absolutely. Tony Brown. Um, yeah. I want you to imagine a world you created exists and then somebody sets up the Sharia insurance company which offers a contract, exactly, which sort of enforces Sharia law. Two questions. Is it allowed to, and what is its relationship with other issues? Good question. Actually, my, my, system, my system would work perfectly in this regard. There's nothing wrong with Sharia. If, people just, if, if you and I agree, we want to be subject to a Sharia law, and insurance company offers Sharia law, then that's fine for you and me. But why do you think both agree? What happens when you want to? No, 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 no. Because then we have insured with different companies. And then what would happen if a conflict is, exists between you and me, I'm insured with in Sharia law and you with Mosaic law or something like this. So then, of course, the arbitration would have come up with solutions that would be acceptable both for those who are subject to Sharia law in, internal, in the internal law code and those people who are covered with Mosaic law in forms of their internal law. Um, that is, for people who agree to be subject to Sharia law, and if they have conflict with each other, then of course Sharia law will be applied. If people agree, uh, uh, canon law will be applied, then yes, then canon law will be applied to them. If we are, are insured with you with canon law, and I'm with mosaic law, whatever, then as soon as it comes to arbitration of the conflict, then some universal law principles will have to be developed that are acceptable to the adherence of the Mosaic law and to the, uh, 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 to the adherence of uh, uh, Islamic law. Um, the same applies if my wife decides, for instance, whilst I'm with Sharia law, she uh, signs up with uh, canon law or Mosaic law, and then we apply the normal procedures even though we happen to be husband and wife. And similarly with children, presumably you insure your own children, but at a point, the child is judged to become an adult and goes off to find his or her own insurance company, which may have a different set of values. Yeah, that's right. So what? Yeah. The, the gentleman is behind uh, uh, Tony to um, talk one with Barcelona. Sorry, I don't know your name. Yes. Ah. Okay. Hello, my name is Michael. Um, my question to you is basically, uh, how would you explain the appeal of states, given that um, states as a system of social, political, and economic organization so endemic to the world. And I'd just like to qualify that um, with an observation that I personally believe that states are an inevitable and uh, unfortunately unavoidable outgrowth of human nature. And the reason I think this is there are very good sociobiological reasons for it. Because imagine if you were, if you were living on a savannah 100,000 years ago and you had a number of warring tribes and what came along was a dominant third tribe, which were more powerful than the other tribes. 
And what it effectively did was provided an independent mechanism through which, through the imposition of force, these tribes could reconcile themselves, could reconcile their differences. Now, obviously, states don't justify themselves today through the imposition of force to do it democratically, as you point out, as we might transition. But I think that although a good evolutionary psychological case can be made for a minimal state, I don't think such a case can be made for an anarchist system. As a matter of fact, I think we have to, <coughs> if you look at the Middle Ages, we did not have states in the Middle Ages. We did have competing legal systems. We did have um, no, no monopoly of ultimate decision making whatsoever. Um, and it took several hundred years for the modern state to develop out of the middle, out of the middle ages. So I don't think, it, it, what, what we do have is, we do of course have authorities developing. We do have uh, highly recognized judges, kings, at the beginning, so to speak, were not state kings. They were just considered to be the most pre prestigious judge to which people would turn if they wanted to have a conflict resolved. Um, but by no means was he the last authority. You could also go to some other king, or you could just uh, appeal to some uh, high-ranking member of the aristocracy or so. Uh, states took hundreds of years to acquire the powers that they currently have. Um, so I don't think we can make the case of uh, whatever. Uh, so, uh, Sociobiolo uh, sociobiology uh, reasons for the existence of the state. What we have now is, of course, uh, people are bombarded uh, with propaganda uh, in public schools, in public universities, in private universities also, because they are funded mostly by public funds. Uh, that without the state, chaos would break out and so forth. But as I said, that that is not right. You can recognize by realizing that we do live, internationally speaking, still in a world of anarchy. Um, without there being less peaceful relationships between members of different uh, countries than among members of the same, one and the same country. Uh, why then did not a world state evolve? Good chance. Um, yeah, I work in insurance company. I actually say that this would be a wonderful world to paint for people who work in insurance company. Because you, you're stating that in order for any economic activity to occur and for the counterpart to be protected, you need to take the insurance policy from me to legislate your activity. What is to prevent the insurance company? and uh, effectively gaining privilege from it. Because, because no, no cartels <laughs> have ever worked in any area except they are, if they are enforced by states. Um, there is always internal and external, internal and external pressure. Uh, the, the companies that are not members of the cartel, uh, they simply do not follow suit. And uh, since they offer lower prices, people will drift off to them. And there is internal pressure because the more efficient members of the cartel uh, will be harmed more than the, the, uh, the less efficient members of, uh, of the cartel. That is because the cartels always have to just agree on what the market share should, uh, should be. Um, and of course, the more efficient companies would tend to expand their market share. The less efficient ones would shrink, have their market share shrink. Uh, and a cartel agreement that fixes, so to speak, what the quota uh, will be, like in the OPEC cartel or so, uh, the least efficient uh, cartel members will be benefited the most, and the most efficient one will be harmed the most because of it. it tends to explode for internal reasons also. So if they yeah, the, the, the worst thing that can happen, then we have a state again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the gentleman in our Hello, Professor Hoffman. My name is Christopher. Uh, following on from Tony Brown's uh, Sharia insurance company question, um, how easy do you imagine it would be 
to adjudicate, if you like, between, in a conflict between a Sharia and a non-Sharia covered um, party, um, given the fact that Sharia law attaches different evidentiary weight on the basis of a person's religion and agenda. And do you foresee anything other than, if you like, a severe curtailment in trade relations between Muslims and non-Muslims in the world you describe? No, but on the arbitration on the arbitration level, of course, they would have to agree on the same evidentiary rules. Um, so even if for internal disputes between one uh, one person insured by the by this company, another person, if they would rely on these types of rules, people would have agreed to this. If conflicts exist with others, then rules of procedure would have to be applied that are acceptable to both of them. Um, both of the companies would have an interest in, uh, in peaceful resolution of the conflict, otherwise the, the cost would explode. Uh, they would become unattractive simply on account of the fact that even on the arbitration level, no agreement can ever be reached. Who wants to be insured that the company constantly gets in conflict with, uh, with, other, uh, with other companies and accordingly pay a far higher premium than would be necessary if some sort of peaceful re uh, resolution due to arbitration is achieved. Mm. We'll take sort of three questions think, together yeah. and, uh, and then we'll um, end uh, the session. So David uh, Goldstone and uh, yes, you have a gentleman here and Tom Burrows and um, sorry for all the others but I think we are running out of time and uh, so very briefly your three questions and uh, we'll uh, conclude there. Uh, Professor Hover, you mentioned a little earlier that you thought that the private enforcement by right, protection agencies of uh, sanctions uh, in relation to victimless crime would not be a major problem because it would be very costly and people would not be inclined generally to pay great premiums to get that sort of product. But is your view simply that it won't be a major problem or is your view that it would be wrong. Because it seems to me that they're not the same thing. One can say the private enforcement of victimless crime is not very likely in the private law society, but it could happen. If it does happen, well, that's fine. That's one position. Or the other position is it's not very likely, but if it does happen, it's wrong and it shouldn't happen. I'm curious to know where you When it does happen, it is wrong nonetheless. But again, Look at, this, look at the arbitration procedure. So if, if one company, for instance, would go after victim <coughs> crimes, then this would be by clients of other companies considered to be a violation of their rights. Okay? Um, that is, if, uh, if I go after you because you smoke dope, um, then you would go to your insurance company and say, look, I haven't done anything. Um, and you need to defend me in this case because I'm aggressed against. Um, and if this then comes up in front of arbitration procedures, the likely decision would be precisely victimless crimes are no crimes. Jim mm. Berlin, uh, I recently had a discussion with my uh, professor in philosophy uh, about what aggression is and then the basic problem was that we, we couldn't agree. I do aggression the way you do it, but he sort of said, well, it's just as much aggression, it's just as much, and it's just as if, 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 if you refuse to pay taxes to help someone who's unemployed, so I couldn't see how we <laughs> continue <laughs> this. <laughs> you simply see this as just as much injustice not to help somebody, not to help them. Well, I think it. your professor should see a doctor. <laughs> <laughs>
but that's just a point. A question, to what extent do you think in the broad economic sense that the existence of things like tax havens and the modern capital market is actually already encouraging a degree of, sort of shopping around, if you like, buying people for favoured kind of jurisdictions in which they choose to live, because there's already a kind of, um, if not, they not an explicit form of yeah. that, that there is some, some movement by usually very wealthy people to find legal codes under which they choose to live. And that this process seems to me yeah. um, is provoking a lot of annoyance by politicians who are probably targeting things like tax havens. Mm -hmm. Because obviously what these places are is in micro form the kind of world that you're talking yeah. about. Um, first question was, was the ostracism, I entirely agree. So we, we can deal with this problem by engaging in ostracism. Um, people who don't behave right, we don't have any dealings with them, and, and either they shape up, uh, or they will be in the fringes of society where they don't disturb other people. Um, with respect to the second one, I... The liberals accepted these rules as the fundamental rules making peaceful life in society possible. Now they realize, however, that even if these rules are intuitively plausible and are um, rules that lead to um, productive, productive lives, and there's no guarantee that people will follow these rules. Uh, there are also people who might engage in robbery, murder, uh, steal, things that other people own and so forth. So there are law breakers. Um, and every society has to deal with these law breakers in some way. Uh, how do we deal with, with people who do not <coughs> adhere to these rules? And classical liberals held the position that this is a task of the state. The state has one and only one task, and that is to make sure that people adhere to the rules that I mentioned before, and that people break these laws will be threatened with punishment, or if they break them, they actually break them, are indeed punished for their uh, violation, for their law violations. Um, now, whether this answer is plausible, and let me emphasize, those who advocate minimal states and classical liberals did advocate the existence of minimal states. You know, this is the only task. The state does not do anything else. The state does not provide education. The state does not provide whatever, social welfare. The state does not provide streets, nothing. This is the only task that the state uh, takes on. Now, if this answer is convincing or not, depends, of course, now on how do classical liberals define the state. And uh, the definition of the state that I suggest is uh, rather uncontroversial. You can uh, same, same definition that you find for Max Weber and uh, many, many others. Uh, is this, this, the state is defined as a territorial. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, having me. Thank you, Sean, in particular. Thank you, Christian. Um, I, um, the the more, more appropriate title than the one that you see on the program would be The Errors of Classical Liberalism and the Idea of a Private Law Society. Um, I will first uh, talk about the errors of classical liberalism and then I will come to the alternative that is the idea of a private law society. Um, the first point I want to explain is uh, what I refer to as uh, the problem of social order. Um, imagine for a second that we live in the Garden of Eden. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, as you all remember, uh, there is no scarcity of uh, anything. Uh, and because there is no scarcity, it is impossible to have any conflicts with each other. If there is a superabundance of goods, uh, how can you possibly have uh, conflicts? Um, except for a minor problem. Even in the Garden of Eden, not everything is that exists in superabundance. A few things are still scarce, and conflicts can arise even in the Garden of Eden because of this. One thing that is scarce is our physical body. Uh, I can have a conflict with another person uh, regarding the use of uh, 
uh, his or her body. And the other thing, by implication, that is, of course, scares and conflicts can arise over this, is the standing room on which the body rests. If I want to stand on a particular place and that place is already occupied by someone else, then a conflict is, of course, possible. In order to avoid these conflicts, it is necessary uh, to formulate rules of exclusive control or property rules regarding scarce resources. And in the Garden of Eden, what we would likely uh, accept as an all-around acceptable rule is um, everybody is the owner of his own physical body uh, and can do with it whatever he wants. Um, and if he wants to do something to the body of somebody else, then he needs to have the permission of this person. And the second related rule, everybody can move wherever they want, except to places that are already occupied by someone else. Um, if we leave the Garden of Eden and enter the real world, then of course this real world is characterized by the fact that we have all around scarcity. Uh, and accordingly, we need rules applying to all sorts of things, not just our own physical body, property rules uh, that specify who can and cannot exercise exclusive control over scarce resources in order to avoid conflicts. And classical liberals have uh, more or less all agreed, and not only classical liberals, uh, almost everybody agrees that there are three fundamental rules um, that make it possible, if we accept them, that conflict can be avoided in a society that is characterized by all around scarcity. The first one is the same that we have in the Garden of Eden. Everybody owns his own body. The second one relates to how do we acquire property, the right to exclusively control previously unowned resources. And there, the rule has been formulated, for instance, by, uh, uh, by John Locke. We acquire property in previously unowned resources by originally appropriating these resources, by being the first ones who do something to resources that nobody before did anything to. Um, by doing something to a piece of land, I become the owner of that piece of land. Um, that is the rule of the homesteading rule or the rule of original appropriation. Um, I can do then whatever I want with whatever I have originally appropriated. Other people need my permission if they want to do anything to it. That <coughs> would avoid conflict. The second rule is uh, I can then with my own body plus originally appropriated resources engage in production. Trans monopolist of ultimate decision making or of ultimate arbitration in any case of conflict. That is, whenever there is a conflict between people, who owns what, who aggressed against whom, who is the victim, who is the aggressor, this decision will be made by the institution of the state. There is no institution higher than the state to which we can possibly appeal. It's the last uh, uh, court of appellation, so to speak. And implied in this is um, that the state is also the territorial monopolist of taxation. That is, the state can unilaterally determine how much the citizens owe him for exercising this task of being the arbitrator of last resort, the ultimate uh, decision, decision maker. Um, now, what is wrong with this answer? If the state is defined like this, then it is easy to see what problems will immediately arise. This, I try to make the point now that a minimal state is, so to speak, an impossible utopia. Um, first thing, uh, if you just look at what is a classic argument against monopolies, they call a state is a monopolist. What is a classic argument against monopoly is monopolies, from the point of view of consumers, um, tend to be 
more expensive or prices are higher than they otherwise would be and the product quality will be lower than it otherwise uh, would be. Um, they are not threatened by competition in this, in this field, uh, so they are not forced to operate at minimum cost and pass the minimum cost on to consumers in the form of lower, uh, lower prices, and they are not forced to continuously try to improve transforming these things into more valuable goods and thereby become the owner of what I have produced. And other people would need my permission if they want to use these products that I have produced. And thirdly, property can also be acquired through voluntary trade or contract from a previous owner to a later, uh, a later owner. Um, I do not want to go into great detail in defending these rules, except to say this, um, that any alternative rule seems on the, from the outset rather absurd, um, that a person should not own his own body, but somebody else should own it. It sounds absurd. The second one, that a person who originally appropriated something um, changed it from an unowned status to an owned status, he should not be the owner. Somebody else who did not appropriate it should be regarded as the owner. Uh, likewise, it seems to be rather absurd that somebody who has not produced something should be regarded as the owner rather than the person who has actually produced, uh, produced something. And it is also quite clear from the outset that if and to the extent that we would follow these rules, not only would conflicts, could conflicts be avoided, all conflicts could be avoided to the extent that we follow these rules, uh, but that if we follow these rules, by and large, prosperity will be maximized. If the producer does not own what he has produced, but somebody else owns part of it, then the incentive to be productive is reduced. If the original appropriator does not own what he has originally appropriated, then the incentive to become an original appropriator using something that was previously not used at all for the first time is reduced and so forth. As I said, um, uh, I don't want to go into a great defense of these rules. I trust that they are intuitively sensible and that most people in their daily lives do indeed follow these rules. So the classic 